Uh, good morning, everyone. So our first session today, uh, we have um, empirical crypto economics. So we have two thought provoking papers. Uh, the first is going to be presented by Kevin May. Kevin's at the University of Texas Macomb School in Austin. Um, it is going to look at pig butchering, which has been a, uh, a scam that's grown over time. And so we're going to learn the economics of it and also how it contributes potentially to slavery. So it's a topic not only of academic importance, but also societal importance. And so we have a second paper that will be going over the study of the reliability of crypto data. So for all of you that are doing empirical work in cryptocurrency, we're going to learn about accuracy and reliability of data providers. Um, so I'm, uh, and what we're going to do, the structure of it is going to be 15 minutes for the presenter, uh, five minutes for the, uh, 10 minutes for the discussant, and then we'll have about five minutes of Q&A. And I will try to uh, give you a heads up with three minutes, one minute, and, and stop. <laughs> so, Kevin, get ready whenever you are. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you so much for the organizer for having us here on the program. Um, John also really wanted to be here also, but unfortunately his oldest kid is graduating from high school today, otherwise he would be here for this program also. So, today we're talking about pig butchering. So what is pig butchering, or Sha Zhu Pan, as in Chinese and the origin of the term here? So pig butchering is a romance scam that has likely targeted each person in this room. It starts with random outreach, seemingly out of the blue, and then after a slowly budding online relationship, victims will then be convinced to move money from their bank accounts into a crypto exchange and then into a spoofed or fictitious exchange, where they'll start to see huge profits, but ultimately fake profits. Victims will also be convinced to start to take money out of this to convince themselves that the money is real, and we call these inducement payments because this induces victims to continue to put more and more money into this fictitious scheme. Now, individuals have reported losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in this scam. This is vastly underreported given the stigma around a scam like this and the exact global scope is uncertain. Pig butchering has emerged as an urgent international threat in the last few years. This is mainly operated by Chinese criminal syndicates out of Southeast Asia, many of which have ties to the ongoing civil war in Myanmar. And this is a big deal in that part of the world. Now, even worse, the UN estimates that there are more than 200,000 scammers operating the scam, many of which are held through human trafficking and modern slavery and forced to perpetrate the scam under threat of physical violence. Crypto has made it easier than ever for scammers to con ordinary people out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this is a heinous crime that the cryptocurrency ecosystem must be able to address. So what do we do? Our motivation is guided by the idea that illicit finance is the lifeblood of transnational organized crime. We study how do criminal networks use cryptocurrencies to move victim funds. To study this, we gather over 4,000 scammer addresses from victim reports, including from the US Institute of Peace, 90% of which of the money that is, is coming from the Ethereum blockchain. But in our paper, we also have results on Bitcoin and Tron. We use a tracing algorithm to follow the flow of funds to their exit point, which would be deposit addresses on exchanges. These would be similar to bank account numbers in that they're tied to distinct customers and they're subject to KYC and anti-money laundering laws. We then describe the network's features, including the inducement payments and transaction costs, and scope the size of total lifetime inflows to these deposit addresses. So the goal is what can law enforcement and crypto players do to stop this crime? So here, let me just give you an example of what we see out the, out of the network from just a single victim report. In this graph, we're plotting exchanges as squares. And then in the red triangles, these are addresses that are scammers reported by victims. So in this case, the victim was instructed to send USDC from Coinbase into this first red triangle. And we can see funds moving into the second red triangle before being swapped through token line into Tether. Now, as we step out further, we can find many nodes that follow this exact same pattern. All of these are almost nearly single use addresses where the money is being consolidated from different exchanges being sent out and consolidated into the second red triangle and ultimately being swapped to token line. Now, where does the money go after this? Well, it continues to massively recirculate through this complex network, sometimes being swapped into DAI, another cryptocurrency, sometimes through Uniswap also. And ultimately, this ends up in deposit addresses in exchanges. Here we're coloring larger, darker deposit addresses, and these are larger deposit addresses, whereas the smaller um, deposit addresses are colored in a lighter color, such as the ones going to Coinbase or Crypto.com. This is just from one report. Here's just a 3% sample of our full data set. 
We're again starting with the victim reported addresses in red triangles, and we can see a massive amount of money flowing from exchanges on the left where they're sorted by total volume, including crypto.com and Coinbase, Binance, and so on. Money moves through this densely connected network, then it's sw often swapped to token line in just a few hops, returns, and ultimately is sent out into deposit addresses and other exchanges. So there are three things that I want to draw your attention to on this slide. One is token line. Uh, token line is a relatively obscure DEX or decentralized exchange based in Southeast Asia. In our paper, we show that pig butchering scammers seem to account for more than you know, the majority of token lines flows. Um, and it seems to really be the hallmark of pig butchering scammers. But this is the platform of choice to be swapping currencies. The second thing I want to draw your attention to is that we orient our analysis sort of from, anal um, from exchanges to exchanges. So on the left, we're looking at addresses or just trace paths that we can find that are starting from addresses like crypto.com and Coinbase, which are US exchanges. And ultimately, we see that they end up in other exchanges, namely Binance, OKX, and Huobi, which are non-US exchanges, thought to be more Asian focused, but also Coinbase and crypto.com. The last thing I want to draw your attention to are the deposit addresses. The darker ones are mostly centered in Binance and OKX, whereas in the Coinbase and Crypto.com, there are also many, many transactions, but these tend to be smaller addresses receiving money. So there's less money going here, but many, many transactions, some of which come from repeated addresses. So there are certain nodes in the dense cluster that send multiple and multiple times into these addresses also. So let me first tell you our major findings before we go further. First, we find that made scammer networks are closely linked together and they follow similar patterns. Namely, they like to use token line, they like to swap into stable coins, and even when we start in Bitcoin and trace over, they use token line to go into wrapped Bitcoin and then into Tether eventually. Our major results are using tracing algorithms to follow the network flows and find deposit addresses. For small deposits, we find over 100,000 potential inducement payments, including a large prevalence of repeat senders, such that 83% of transactions are coming from addresses with more than 10 transactions. We also look at the large deposits, including many of these are potential scammer accounts, and the total lifetime inflow of these accounts is $75 billion. Lastly, we also look at transaction costs from gas fees and swaps. And as a percentage of total outflows, this amounts to just 87 basis points, which is to say that it's very cheap for these people to obfuscate and money launder. We also look at a backtrace where if we started deposit addresses, what are the origins of these funds? We find over $15 billion coming from US exchanges. Lastly, there's also documenting a shift of inflows of where money is coming from into the network, and we see that before 2021, much of it is coming from Asian exchanges, but after 2021, there's a big shift towards US exchanges. In the paper, we have other results on robustness, cross-chain tracing, comparisons to other scams, and other connectedness measures about the more network science view of this. Now, this isn't just an academic exercise. Here, we have many practical implications, namely that crypto seems to be enabling this massive criminal network due to the ease of transfers, cheap money laundering, and ultimately this is serving as the impetus for human trafficking. Crypto players and policymakers should do much more to immediately stop the funds flowing to this network. For example, US-focused exchanges like Coinbase and Crypto.com are very common entry points. They receive many inducement payments, transact many times, and this indicates that monitoring is possible for these exchanges, but likely not rigorously occurring today. Token line and its users facilitate substantial obfuscation, which is to say money laundering, and hedge funds that might be providing liquidity to these exchanges are ultimately profiting by trading with human traffickers. Lastly, Binance, Huobi, and OKX are common exit points, and they hold custod their custodians for vast amounts of criminal funds. Now, there's a growing dark market literature in crypto. Our contribution to this is that we do bulk tracing to map a broader network of scammer, broader scammer network at scale to find their sources, the full scope of what they do, and their methods. We also highlight the economics of transaction cost swaps. And also, this is a big systematic study on Ethereum, whereas most of the dark market research before has been on Bitcoin, given that Ethereum is where most of our activity is occurring. So in my remaining time, I'm going to tell you about our methodology, our trace, tracing the network flows, and ultimately sizing the network. So let me first tell you about the methodology. We start by reported addresses here in this red triangle, and we use the Integra tracing tools to follow the flows of these funds. In this example, this node is receiving money from crypto.com. We can trace it forward, including tracing through token line. 
We have conservative guardrails set up such that, for example, we stop if we run into large addresses that are too large that we can't identify. We will terminate the trace there. In this example, this path leads to Binance or Binance deposit address. And so our second step is we look at the lifetime inflows into this deposit address. As a third step, we also look at the related adjacent addresses here. So these are going to be addresses that also receive money from the same network nodes that are sending, from, that are sending into these deposit addresses. Now, the reason we do this, and this is a common tracing heuristic, is that um, exchange deposit addresses are unique and tied to distinct and known users, so that if I wanted to access the money that was being sent here, I would have to log into a Binance, my Binance account using my Binance password to be able to do so. So this is a common address to think about um, attribution of deposit addresses. So let's talk about deposit addresses. Here we're bringing them into four columns based on the total lifetime inflow that they receive. I'll start on the left, where we look at the, the smallest addresses. We can see that many of these addresses are centered in Coinbase and Crypto.com in this kind of hashed green and blue at the top left. But also there are also many likely victims in um, OKX, Holby, and Binance. These are the smallest addresses, and here we're going to focus on inducement payments. For the larger addresses that receive more than $100,000, these are more likely to be scammers, and they're more centered in Binance and OKX. We find that the majority of money that we trace ends up in these large addresses. So let's first talk about the small addresses. Here we're plotting any network node that sends money into deposit addresses, into small deposit addresses. We're going to plot the cumulative number of transactions from these addresses. Um, in red, these are going to be addresses that only transact one time. But then as they transact more, we're going to shift the color into blue. We can see that there are many addresses that transact over 50 times, over 100 times even, um, and then eventually stop and they're replaced by other addresses that are sending small amounts of money into deposit addresses. Again, we, these are likely inducement payment senders. And over time, this activity has grown tremendously. Overall, we find over 15,000 transactions of small amounts being sent into Coinbase as likely inducement payments, 82% of which are coming from addresses with more than 10 transactions. This is to say that the majority of addresses of activity is coming from known addresses, and Coinbase has the opportunity to have stopped this scam in the middle. Here's the graph for Crypto.com of addresses sending to Crypto.com deposit addresses. Again, it follows a similar pattern uh, with activity really picking up in 2022. For Binance, activity is much denser in 2021, but the pattern is still similar of high concentration in people that are sending into these addresses. And in Huobi, it's extremely dense. We find over 30,000 transactions of this type, mostly concentrated in 2021 and abruptly falling off. And I'll get back to this in a few slides. Next, I'm going to tell you about our sizing. Uh, we're going to talk about sizing. So over the next three slides, I'm going to show you three different numbers. And as a refresher, the first number is going to be the total direct amount of money that we can trace from victim reports into large deposit addresses, including money that we're cross-tracing from Bitcoin into Ethereum and money post swaps. After we find these deposit addresses, the second number I'll show you is going to be the total lifetime inflow into these deposit addresses. And then lastly, we're going to look at the associated deposit addresses as they do, in, as kind of described in Victor 2020 also. The first number is we find over $1.7 billion of money flowing into large deposit addresses that can be directly attributed to victim reports. Most of this is concentrated in Binance and OKX. As we look at the lifetime inflow of these, of these addresses, we see $27 billion of money flowing into scammer accounts. Most of this, again, is concentrated in Binance, OKX and Huobi, so we see more of it as we reach further back in time, coming from Huobi and OKX, but also large amounts going into FTX. Lastly, if we look at associated deposit addresses, we find over $75 billion of inflow going into these exchange accounts. Now, we should apply some caveats to this number. This may be large because it may apply, it might include revenues from more than just pig butchering. For example, these criminals also do human trafficking. They ransom the human people that they human traffic, and they also do money laundering. So those proceeds can also be included in this number. This also might be a small number in that we only have a sample of reported addresses. We don't have the full universe, though we try, of total addresses that are doing this scam. And so because of that sampling issue, um, this number could also be larger. Lastly, we look at a backtrace where we start from deposit addresses and we ask ourselves, where does the money come from? In this graph, we're plotting 
monthly number of transactions over time split by hour of day. In orange, these are inflows coming in from US exchanges versus in this darker colors or in purples, these are going to be money coming in from non-US exchanges, namely Binance and Huobi. What we can find is that in 2021, the majority of activity of money flowing into the scammer network is coming from ultimately from non-US exchanges during Chinese waking hours. However, in, in 2021, China bans crypto transactions, and then the scammers seem to shift such that the new inflows are coming from Crypto.com, Coinbase, Gemini Kraken, and FTX. And this shift is pretty dramatic, and, and now the activity is coming in from US waking hours. So just to summarize, I'm going to summarize with just the practical implications we started with. Essentially, crypto seems to be enabling this massive criminal network, including ease of transfers and, um, and money laundering, and crypto players really need to think more carefully about what we can do to stop this relatively simple scam. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for that presentation. So we have uh, Katia Nunova from McMaster University here to discuss. And so we'll have five minutes to do so. Oh, I thought it's 10. <laughs> yes, it is 10. <laughs> I say five, you'll be fine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I could be. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me uh, to discuss the paper. I, um, the title, to be honest, kind of almost scares me, just the words, the slavery and then the pig butchering. So I started with uh, Googling what the pig butchering is, and as Kevin has explained, so many of us probably were trying to sort of, or, 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 uh, attempted to get, uh, kind of asked to get into it. You, you start by either SMS, like wrong number, or I'm sorry, but let's be friends nonetheless, uh, or a dating app, and eventually this relationship, some of them we ignore, like I ignore all of them, maybe you don't, uh, but some people move into WhatsApp, into Telegram chats, and it takes a long time. Like, this process is a few months, because you're wondering, like, how do I, like, contribute money? How, how do I get, fall, how do I fall for it? And it's, it's a process of a few months, we're in the pandemic, lonely people, eventually you see, oh, this is a friend that helps me make money, people make money, they teach you how to use different crypto exchanges, different cryptocurrencies, so it all sounds friendly until you're gone $75 billion. And if you want to look at it, there is a, I guess it's a pseudonym, Jim Browning uh, has a YouTube video on inside a pig butchering scam. So it's in Dubai and he talks about this uh, people that are in Dubai forced to sort of communicate with you over the months. Um, but like, what does that have to do with slavery? And again, as Kevin pointed out, uh, um, UN, there was a UN report that said over uh, 120,000 people in Myanmar and over 100,000 in Cambodia may be held in the situations where they're forced to carry on online scams. So these are the people that sort of communicate with you. Hi, I'm Kimberly, and uh, uh, let's, uh, let, let's do something. So. Um, the numbers differ depending on the reports. It's not just sort of um, crypto directly. Some of it is related to crypto, but online casinos, which also might be um, used for crypto. So just recently, and it keeps coming. So the first news is from a year ago. The second news is like a month ago, two months ago, where hundreds rescued from this love scam center in the Philippines. So it's, this, this numbers are there indeed. Um, now, when it comes to the paper, and Kevin presented it in a slightly different fashion, I guess, the way it's written. Um, so when you look and Google pig butchering, this is the news that comes up. So the only message that the press took from this is $75 billion. And I guess the issue is stop immediately. And I'm not sure, I think my main comment is, well, is it 75 billion and should we stop immediately? Uh, and in your goals, when you're describing the goal for the paper, is one of the goals was, well, what can law uh, enforcement and crypto players do? And I think this should be the message of the paper. What can we do now that we know this? Um, so the other part of the message was, and Kevin didn't bring it up, was that Tether is actually responsible for 84% of this. And I'm finding this surprising and I kind of would like to have more information on it because partly, I mean, this is, you can freeze it. <laughs> so so why, why, is it, uh, why is it used? 
Um, so the 75.3 billion number, and I'm not a forensic uh, expert, so I cannot trace it. But again, I Google and there are two different opinions. So one of them is from Taylor Monaghan, who is uh, uh, from MetaMask, says it's absurd. And you can go through the Twitter feed to see why she says it's absurd. Um, the other one is from uh, Jan, Santiago, Jan Santiago, who is uh, with... Uh, 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 chain brim and it's part of the uh, part of the system part part of the uh, organization that actually helped uh, the authors with the addresses they understand they say no um, it's not absurd hey, why is it absurd why is it not absurd um, let's look at other numbers so there are other numbers for instance fbi has uh, internet Cal crime complaint center report so from their report the total crime losses crypto crime losses in 2023 it's to the us i guess complaints is 12 billion um, much of this is investment, so four and a half billion. The confidence Roman scams reported to FBI are sort of on the order of half a billion. Um, the ones that are crypto connected are 5.6 billion and most of them um, uh, most of them are investment related. The other number that sort of often comes up in these discussions is the chain analysis report. And the chain analysis report basically says the total crypto scam revenue over the same number, over the same period, is about 26 billion. So, and that's the total, so of which the pig butchering is just the sliver. Um, so going to what do I think, like what, where, where would I like to have more clarity on the 75 billion? So we're talking about trace part of the first reported address, uh, and this is what Kevin also showed. So we have these addresses. The authors focus on the paths, as Kevin explained really well, uh, that start from exchange wallets and sort of touch this and, and at user deposit addresses. So he plotted this network where eventually there are addresses that they identify as deposit addresses at exchanges. And they sum all inflows to these addresses and they find this is where the 75 billion number comes from. So I have a few kind of comments, questions. So one concern that I have is we're using public data. And given that it's public data, we should be all able to sort of redo this and see is it 75 billion. Now, the the approach and chain, like it's not just the authors. Everybody that does it has some sort of proprietary system. but. I think the bar is higher on us academics when we're saying we're using some proprietary tool to trace this and we get a number which is extremely large which makes the headlines. I, I would like to have more transparency about how this comes about, not just the proprietary tools. The related concern is with respect to addresses. So you say that you collect just over a thousand addresses uh, from boards uh, that are reported as scammer addresses. But then on top of that, there's a large number of addresses that are shared with you. And then you apply screens, which again are unidentified. And that's how we end up with 47,000 addresses. So some of the numbers that are reported in the paper, there are a lot of numbers, a lot of pictures, but I would like to have more transparency so that we, we can you know, potentially redo this, potentially check the this. The second concern question is, and Kevin mentioned this in the presentation, but it's a little less clear or a little less uh, prominent in the paper, that these addresses, they don't necessarily, all, all the inflows don't necessarily relate to pig butchering scams. So chances are they're probably all involved in some illicit activities. Um, but there are others, illegal gambling, uh, uh, capital controls. So what are they? Um, I would kind of also like to know where does the 75 billion exit? Do they exit? Uh, and why do you trace when, why when you backtrace, you only have 40 anti and 75 um, exit? Um, and then my next comment is that you're using the reported scammer address, but the scam tactics are evolving. And at this point, it just gets so scary that I'm surprised uh, I haven't yet fallen for this. <laughs> but um, so the scammers, you don't, it, it's, it's hard to fall for, here's the address sent the funds to. It's much, much easier to fall for, oh, download this app that allows you to have they return with zero risk, maybe not for a finance professor. However, there are now DeFi scams that, you know, you download legitimate wallet and somehow you just get tricked to run a script that basically gives the scammers the permission 
to drain the funds from your legitimate wallet, such as a trust wallet. So in this case, there's really no scam address to be reported. It's the victim's address that we need to trace this. And I would like to sort of better understand how this, this is, uh, just speaks to maybe the number is actually larger than 75 billion because, um, and then uh, go in with crypto and stop this immediately. Well, frauds are going to be there. The first recorded fraud, you know, it's insurance fraud 300 BC. There's credit card fraud, identity theft. Uh, Swift Network was penetrated. Uh, uh, New York Fed uh, wired the money. Um, five five instructions uh, just google bangladesh bangladesh bank uh, scheme but basically you can penetrate if you want um, um, it's not just crypto crypto does allow scams at scale admittedly so for sure it's it's easier than it used to be before um, however what i'd like to see more in the paper is where can we, where, where, where can the law enforcement and, and what, what can we do? So, and going back to the key messages, well, 75 billion lost, I'm not sure if it's a pig butchering scam. And the other part is it's lost, but you traced it. So we're now able to trace it. So even though it does allow scams at scale, it also allows us to trace it. And I think we should use these tools. And my very last slide is that I mean, there are other numbers that we could come up, and crypto crime is in trillions. And are we going to stop using the internet? Probably not. Instead, we're trying to find solutions to make this safer and secure. And maybe blockchain is actually a solution. So I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Katya, for that. Uh, Kevin, did you want to take a second to respond? Yeah. Okay. No, I can just shout if it. Okay. That's okay. Fine. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that great discussion. And I think you bring up a lot of good points. I'll just address a few of them. So, you know, we really do stand by this number. This is something that we've worked on for a year straight. We've stress tested it a bunch of ways. And we feel really confident that we're, what we're seeing is true. And just on the topic of other reports that are working on this, you know, chain analysis, for example, we think of them as pretty conflicted. They're an industry player. Tether is one of their big customers. And so if we want to have a definitive source on this, we should, as academics, have a story that we can say. Um, and IC3, they're only doing reported scams, and so it's just hugely underreported. So what we're doing here as new is we're really mapping out the full network, not just the small bits that we can see. Um, in terms of transparency, I mean, we're working on a replication package. All the things that we do will be able to be seen on chain also, and so I think we're not so worried about that per se, but of course, we're happy to talk to anyone that's interested in learning more about tracing. Um, and then lastly, just on screens and kind of the screens that we're applying. So in the paper, we do say, oh, we apply these screens, these screens. But we do list all of them out. And, um, and we also, like, we'll have lists, for example, as an example of a screen, there's specific smart contract functions that if you use them, we're saying, okay, you're probably not a pick working scammer. We throw these out. And so we'll list all of these smart contract functions that we're screening out to throw out addresses. And these screens are also some of the examples of why, for example, we start by saying a $75 billion exiting, but only $40 billion coming in. That's because as we trace backwards, we're kind of running into screens and we're kind of throwing these addresses out. We don't let ourselves get too far from our known truth of deposit addresses. Um, but other than that, I mean, I think there's a lot to discuss here. I really thank you for the awful discussion. Great, thank you. So we have time for some questions. Yeah, go ahead. Just a couple questions and comments. The first one is, what really separates from pig butchering from other forms of crypto-enabled uh, scams or you know, ransomware attack is, is the, the physical, the, the link to the physical world where you have human trafficking and all that. Uh, I'm wondering if you can do something to, to link that part more because the scaling happens, it's not surprising that scaling happens at the virtual front, right? Just digital payments. Um, but, you know, the human trafficking, it, People need to travel over to the place and all that. Can, can you kind of link to that? That would that, be um, very interesting. Uh, another question kind of related to uh, Katya's uh, earlier comment is uh, how much of this is kind of substitution of other forms of transactions that, that's happening through casinos and all that? I know it's hard to, to uh, maybe obtain data on that. Um, and, and I believe this has scaled up the, the, the size of the crimes. Um, but, but, you know, any discussion on that would be, would be interesting. And I know you documented um, the patterns about the criminals a bit more, um, their nose and uh, characteristics. 
um, maybe it's already in the paper, but about the victims, right? Because these are all kind of retail victims. They are not corporate um, victims. Um, what can we say about their patterns and maybe as a way to prevent this, right? We can work on the front of criminals and regulators, but maybe through education for the, for the victims. Um, you know, that, that, that might be another angle to, to help. Yeah, those are all good points. Um, so we've been thinking about this. You know, all of our data, we're looking at on-chain things, and so it's hard to tie necessarily to like specific scam compounds or specific victims. We're still working on getting more data to look at that. For example, we have been talking to groups that work with people that have been rescued from these scam centers, and we know where their families have paid ransoms. When we check those ransom addresses, we do find them also in our network. So from that, we're able to tie it specifically to specific compounds, but that data is very scarce. Additionally, like I have a family friend that was scammed from this recently, and then when I asked him about it, he gave me the addresses. I'm able to find also those same addresses kind of ex post in the network that we've mapped also, and he's never reported this anywhere either. And so we're still trying to collect more data live to try to connect these different things, like you said, about retail investors. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of uh, like whether it's other money or not, this is something we're working on follow-up work. We do compare it to other scams and other flows of dense networks in crypto. We do see like there is a good amount of separation that this is something very distinct compared to other entities like online gambling. Um, but this is still something we're kind of thinking about for follow-up work also. Um, to what extent are you seeing the uses of mixers to obfuscate fund flows on chain? Yeah, it's a great question. We actually see no tornado cash in here. The main swapping that they're doing is just through token So you're not excluding mixed things, they're just not happening at all. Yeah, they, you just don't see it. I think it partly is because they need to like be able to offload it into places without being seized too easily. Are, are they using bridging to move from chain to chain? Yes, we do see that. So we do trace from Bitcoin into Ethereum. And we were able to follow the money and they coincidentally do intersect like from your point, they intersect into the same Ethereum network that we've already mapped. Uh, yeah. uh, what is the percentage or value of fraud per dollar for crypto as compared with uh, uh, fiat currency? You have a number. Uh, the reason I'm asking uh, the critics of crypto, how do you defend, how do the uh, promoters of crypto defend themselves against this? What is the dollar value? Yeah, it's a tricky question. I think my co-author would say that 100% of crypto is fraud. But what <laughs> uh, we'll have to work on that more. I mean, I think a lot of fraud is moving into crypto. And Interpol puts out huge numbers, even related to this, of trillions of dollars that they're trying to map out. So it, it's, um, I don't think we have firm answers to that. One more question. So I'm going to go back to the point that Katya had made about uh, what is it that we can do. Um, so the $35 billion is a big number. Um, a lot of, sort of I don't know, um, politicians primarily will be potentially grabbing that number, or other agencies are going to be grabbing, grabbing this number. And without really sort of identifying what, uh, what the pitfalls are, where the breakdown is happening, which framework is really the most vulnerable, what type of um, sort of consumers are being targeted, sort of profile, like uh, identifying the demographics, is I think crucial um, to uh, to making a positive impact. Otherwise, I can see this being <laughs> potentially more harmful than beneficial. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate it. We're we're open to lots of discussion on what we can do in these things. I know just this week, Meta and kind of the dating apps launched a new initiative to fight pig butchering, but this has been going on for years. And so I'm just thinking that that's really the place where you need to address it head on is on these messaging sites. And we're happy to work with them to, to think about what else they can do. Really. Yeah. Thank you. If you have other questions, we'll, uh, Kevin will be available, I'm sure, during the coffee break. So for the sake of time, we're going to move on to our second paper. Um, go ahead. So we have uh, a study of the reliability of uh, crypto data provision, and here to present is uh, Gustavo uh, Schwinkler from Santa Clara University. <clears throat> Thank you so much for including the paper in the program. I'm, I'm excited to present this. And part of this research came about through our frustration, honestly, with dealing with crypto data. And um, obviously, you don't need to mention it here. Crypto is bouncing back this year, thanks to Ethereum in particular this week. Um, but more importantly for us that are more empirically minded is that crypto data has become a really big focus basically for research in the space. So this is just Google Trends 
for the keyword crypto data since 2009. And you can see that it peaked in, 2000, in 2022. It kind of cooled last year during the crypto winter and now has kind of bounced back. Uh, so people are searching for crypto data. People are also using crypto data in publications. So these are the number of new publications that mention the words crypto and the word data in the title or abstract. In 2022, there were 600 new papers that, that did this. Uh, and this number is only growing over time. So data is important, especially for the analysis of cryptocurrencies. And uh, to, to uh, at least to our understanding, there was not a very good systematic approach to studying kind of the quality of the data that, that is available in, in the market. So what we do in this paper is, is we look really at a very narrow sliver of the crypto data that is available. We focus on market data basically for, um, for uh, centralized exchanges. So it's just very basic data. Uh, in passing, we review basically 20 of the most frequently used vendors in the space. So there's a bunch of different crypto, uh, crypto data vendors that focus on different types of data. There's some that are very famous, right? Like CoinMarketCap, uh, Messari, and Kaiko. And everybody has their different aspects. So one thing that we do is just for all these data providers, we, provide our, we de develop kind of a survey of what exactly is the data that they provide, how their APIs work, what it costs. The average monthly subscription for one of these providers is around $600 per month. So it's not cheap necessarily to get access to crypto data. And then for these yellow providers that we have here, there are eight providers at this point. We really narrowly, we really dive in and, and do a deep dive into what's the data that they're providing and, and how does it compare basically across providers. Um, so we're going to look at these eight providers. Um, there are, uh, these are providers that are very commonly used in, in, in the market. So these are for all the providers that we considered, how often they're mentioned in, in research, basically that analyzes crypto data. So we search on Dimensions AI, how often these providers are mentioned combined with the word data. You can see that CoinMarketCap is the most frequently used data provider in the space. Nomix is another one, which is interesting because Nomix no longer operates. Kaiko is one of them, uh, Glassnode, CoinGecko. These are pretty common providers. So this is not something that, that these are not providers that we just randomly pick. These are kind of big providers. And what we do is we, we document that there's pervasive quality issues in, in the providers, in the data that they supply that effectively render the providers on their own unreliable. Uh, a lot of the issues that we're going to find are going to include labeling issues, uh, uh, revisions. There's a lot of revisions of historical data without really disclosing it. Uh, there's lots of measurement errors, and I'm going to show you a little bit of this. There's latency, which is a problem that a lot of people have looked at. We're not going to dive too much into that. And then there are also system, like big system downtimes uh, compared to kind of standard like SaaS services. They're like 100 times as often downtimes in, in these data providers. And like what we're going to show is that because these data providers, because there are these quality issues, empirical analysis of cryptocurrency markets is, is going to be challenging. There's a lot of, I mean, obviously, the, this, as I'm going to show you, enables kind of p-hacking in the space. Um, and in particular, even without really trying to kind of manipulate, <laughs> do kind of any kind of p-hacking, just different choices in terms of how and where you get data from is going to have a big impact on, on the outcomes that you would get basically from empirical work. This is kind of connected to this work by Mengfeld and Al, where they look at kind of non-standard errors uh, across uh, research. Now, the way we are going to address this problem is we're going to develop an algorithm that aggregates data across providers, across all these different uh, data vendors, and show that under certain conditions, we can obtain basically correct data once we aggregate the data across, uh, across all the providers. To show how this impacts empirical analysis, we're going to apply basically uh, an asset pricing model to cryptocurrencies and then estimate it based on different data data sources as well as our, as our aggregated data and show you what, what kind of the implications are. Now at the end, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about what this means basically for cryptocurrency research and, and empirical applications in this space. So let me get started right away. So 
what do these data providers do? Well, because as all of you know, right, cryptocurrencies are traded on many different platforms at the same time. What the providers do is basically they aggregate data from the different exchanges, right? Uh, and um, this is not easy to do, right? Most of these providers are venture backed. They have raised around the medium size of a crypto deal on average in their, at the time of raising. Some of them have Series A at this point. They've raised a lot of money to do this work. It's not something that, that basically any one of us can just do out of a whim and come up with a really sophisticated way of doing this. Um, and it, so in effect, what the providers are going to do is every one of them is going to have a choice as to where they're going to aggregate data from. Like some exchanges will aggregate from Coinbase and Binance. Some exchanges will aggregate from Kraken and OKX. And every, provi every provider will have different choices. Uh, and that's going to introduce issues, as I will show you. Now, we're going to focus primarily on, on centralized data, so sex uh, data. Uh, we believe that that's a good first start. Right? An alternative is you could look at DEXs right, and just get on-chain data that is probably clear, cleaner. But um, where we approach this problem from, right, is that if you are basically fitting a big AI or a big sophisticated statistical model to the data, you want to basically capture lots where most of the data is generated. Indexes, at least from my last measurement, account for around 10 to 15 percent of the total trading volume in the market. So it's only a subset of the data that you would be capturing if you look at DEXs only. So this is an example of what happens, right? So what we did is, going back to 2018, for each one of these providers, every single month we collected the 250 largest coins. And then over each one of the months since 28, from 2018 through 2024, we're right now expanding this to now, we looked at basically daily OHLCV data, basically open, high, low, close uh, volumes and market caps. And then we basically recorded all the data. What I'm showing here is, for each coin and each day, what's the median closing price? And then I compare the pro closing prices reported by the different providers relative to that median closing price across the providers. Assuming that all of these providers are trying to do the same, the median closing price seemed to be like a robust benchmark for us to kind of assess this. So we have around 5 million crypto day instances in this data sample even though we're only covering the 250 largest coins because we repeat this over different months. In the end, we get a, a sample of around 600 uh, coins, distinct coins. And the first thing you can see here is that out of all of these 5 million instances, only 93% fall within a plus minus 5% confidence band around one. Now, it's hard to tell what exactly the right confidence band would be here. We just took plus minus 5% to censor the data because there are lots of outliers. But even with this kind of censored data set, if we assume that there's measurement errors and they're normally distributed somewhere around one, we would expect only 4.5% basically to fall outside of a plus minus two standard deviation band around one. Here we get around 7% of the instances fall outside this confidence band. So the left tails basically are too fat here. Um, and what that tells you is that there's a lot of providers that report prices that are far away from the median price across the different vendors. Okay? Now, you may expect that. Uh, I'm going to argue later on that this is not necessarily that big of a problem. Where it's a very big problem is essentially for volumes. Lots of you here in the audience have worked on reported volumes. For volumes, only one third of the sample falls within this plus minus 5% confidence interval. And within the censored, in the censored sample, 10% uh, fall basically outside the plus minus two standard deviation band around one, which means volumes are extremely noisy. Uh, uh, and there's lots of reasons for why volumes are noisy, right? There's people that have worked on wash trading. We know that exchanges have incentives to kind of artificially inflate their volumes. What we argue here is that this problem is, is very distinct from, from wash trading. The, what happens here is that basically the providers are aggregating data from many different sexes, right? And because the distribution of volumes across exchanges is heavy tailed, right? We fit um, a power law with infinite variance to the distribution of volumes across exchanges. 
it's going to be really hard basically to aggregate volume data across exchanges. Even if there was no watch trading and everybody reported exactly the correct data, you would naturally get at very extreme differences in, in reported volumes just based on aggregating data from different providers. Now, on top of that, watch trading makes, makes this problem even worse. Um, and it, it basically, it, 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 it accentuates the problem for larger coins. So larger coins are actually more affected by, by this problem because larger coins trade on more exchanges and therefore there's more discretion basically for the data vendors to select where they're going to aggregate data from. And that makes this problem essentially more pronounced. Um, I have five minutes, so I'm going to skip this. Um, so naturally, the, the aggregating crypto data across platforms is an, is an intrinsically hard problem. So that's kind of one of the big takeaways. It makes it even harder because there's a lot of quality issues. I'm not going to talk about them here. Uh, many exchanges uh, re have repeated. Many, many providers uh, have measurement errors. We report systemic measurement errors. Labeling issues are pervasive. Some uh, providers reuse the same labels for different coins. Um, they don't account for uh, forks or token swaps, which makes the data noisy. There's lots of revisions, so just using this data is, is naturally hard. Uh, now, this has a big impact basically on asset pricing. So what, the way we assess this is we calibrate uh, um, the asset pricing factor of the UL, right, where we just fit a market size and momentum risk factor to the sample of cryptocurrencies. We focus on a rolling basis of the 100 largest coins in the market which may be artificially biased towards big caps, but I mean, many coins in the top 100 coin, uh, sample are, are very small. And you can see that even for the market factor, which we, you would think is very easy to replicate, different providers will give you different data here. It's even worse for sort-based portfolio uh, uh, factors because if volumes and market caps are off, then basically the sorting of a lot of these coins will be off. So when you build long short portfolios where you take, say, the top, the top decile or the top quintile and the bottom quintile, this, if the sorting is off, you're going to get very different factors. And the discrepancy is massive, right? This is a, a discrepancy between providers of 10x for the momentum factor and, uh, also, and, 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 and more than 10x, basically, for the size factor. So this has a real impact, basically, on how you calibrate your, your models. Now, the way we address this is we propose an algorithm that aggregates data across the different providers. And the algorithm is relative, it's very technical, but it's kind of intuitive. So what we're going to do is we're going to use basically two metrics. We're going to take a cross section of providers and then use two metrics to identify the providers that are correct, basically, on average. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to run all the providers through like a coarse filter that's going to exclude basically all the providers that are reporting data that's not consistent with the other providers. Say we're going to use market caps to identify this. So we're going to do clustering based on market caps and then identify providers that have report similar market caps for one coin. And then once we have all the providers that report similar market caps, we're going to run the providers again through a second filter that's based on a much tighter uh, uh, clustering algorithm to identify the providers that report similar close prices on top of reporting similar market caps. Like you can add more layers here. The more you filter, the more precise this is going to become. And in the end, out of all providers that survive, we're going to take the median out of them and then, um, and then uh, aggregate the data. Um, I'm going to skip this. So we show that once you aggregate this data and you apply it in the same model with the same uh, the same uh, providers, you actually get meaningful estimates. So we confirm basically a 1.4%, uh, these are weekly data actually, per week, uh, market risk premium. And then we reject basically the null hypothesis that this three-factor model prices the cross-section of cryptocurrencies, which is consistent with some work that Will and other people have done. So to wrap up, what does this really tell us then basically about the landscape of cryptocurrencies? Well, because we don't know the truth, right? We don't know exactly what the right price of a coin is at which point of time. It kind of depends where you are. Uh, you need a cross-section of providers, basically, to be able to identify where the errors are. 
So it, for a consumer of data, this means that you're going to have to spend a lot of money basically trying to get data from different places to be able to actually get something that's truthful. Uh, for academics, for us, obviously what this means is that it's going to be really hard to replicate empirical work unless you have access to exactly the same data. If you re-download the data because there's revisions, it's going to be hard to, to, ma to match that. I think for regulators, really the bigger, problem, the bigger question is really, is there scope here for some potential regulation, right? Um, we have standard identification ways, uh, uh, ways to identify stocks and equities. There is no such thing in, in the crypto space, so every provider identifies coins differently and there's issues with that. Do we need guidelines on how to aggregate data across providers, uh, across exchanges, right? Do we need to include certain exchanges? For sure, does there need to be market cap restrictions? And then the last point is that possibly there's uh, consumer protection issues here because it's expensive to collect this data and uh, many providers recycle data from each other. Um, that's it. I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh. Okay, so um, here to discuss this paper is Don Hua Shin from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this very um, thought-provoking paper. Um, so in this figure, I list top five and uh, bottom five of lar 100 largest cryptocurrencies uh, featured in uh, CoinGecko and uh, CoinMarketCap. And as you can see, top five cryptocurrencies are the same. But if you take a look at the price, you, you start to see some like slight deviation, about like one to 2% of the, the difference. But if you take a look at uh, trading volume, this discrepancy is actually much larger. For example, if you take a look at um, uh, Tether's trading volume uh, yesterday, it's about $40 billion. But if you take a look at Tether uh, trading volume in coin market, Tether is about $70 billion. So there's a substantial difference. And another interesting is, it, is if you take a look at uh, the, the bottom five of the uh, 100 cryptocurrencies, then you can see that the, these cryptocurrencies are entirely different. So what, this, what is this paper about? This paper is about uh, this, uh, documenting this substantial discrepancy. Whether this is big, and if that's the case, what's the reason? And how does it affect uh, the empirical asset pricing? And how can we address this problem using some uh, useful statistical approach? And that's what this paper is about. I can summarize this paper in two slides. Uh, there are three issues in the data provider. First, there's inconsistent labeling. Basically, uh, some providers use BTC and the others use XBT to uh, for for um, bitcoins, and this kind of inconsistency exists even in a data provider sometimes. And there is some discrep discrepancy in major metrics like price and market uh, capitalization and volume, and this is a fraction of observation deviating more than five percent of the median. It's about seven percent for prices, and it becomes much larger for market cap, about twenty percent. What's even more crazy is this trading volume. About like 70% of them are outliers. And this kind of effect is more pronounced for uh, small coins for these three metrics and larger co coins for this uh, volume. And there is also a vintage issue. Uh, some providers often revise old data, meaning if I download the data from CoinMarketCap today and I download the, the same data after one year, then you, you can see some discrepancy in the old data. And the authors uh, construct these three factors following uh, Liu, Spinsk, and Wu's uh, paper. Uh, in order to mitigate the concern that uh, it can be affected by uh, outliers, they propose uh, interesting algorithm. Basically, they make clusters based on uh, average market cap and coin uh, close price, and uh, identify the largest cluster where um, possibly uh, more and more um, reliable providers uh, will be located. And they use this data to, to aggregate. And the results, empirical results, are quite conflicting, uh, meaning um, there's no size, uh, no, no uh, significant return for market and size factor, as you can see. And, but we, we observed uh, some significant results consistent with the Leo um, Sibisky and Wu's uh, JF uh, paper. But if you take a look at these numbers closely, these numbers are quite different. And as you can imagine, asset pricing uh, has produced quite conflicting results as well. And this aggregation algorithm is quite reliable because it's not heavily influenced by some outliers like coin paprika. 
and it produced the results somewhat consistent to uh, the, the famous provider, a coin market cap. I have a couple of comments. The first comment is about its contribution. I think this is quite a timely research because uh, so far many people have used coin market cap when they do, uh, when they do uh, most of the empirical asset pricing research. However, I start to see that many recent papers uh, use other types of uh, data. And initially, I thought this is not a big problem because the data provider initially go to the exchange API to download the data. So if they did a good job, then there shouldn't be any major discrepancy. But this paper showed that there, are, there is a huge discrepancy, which is quite useful. And the execution is great. Uh, it requires a lot of effort, time, and energy. But not only that, but also it requires a lot of money to download all these things. And they did a pretty good job. And the findings are really novel. There's a substantial difference in prices, volume, and market cap. Especially, we need to be very careful when we interpret this aggregate volume and market cap. Overall, I believe uh, all empirical crypto asset pricing researchers should consider this paper very seriously for, for their future research. And my second comment is, uh, is about the reliability. We need to better understand the source of this uh, discrepancy. And I think uh, this reliability issue can be decomposed into two parts. One is accuracy, the other is coverage. What do I mean by accuracy? Some providers are probably more accurate than the others. Coverage means different providers choose a different set of exchanges. Some, some uh, providers use probably 50 exchanges. The other pro uh, use probably 500 exchanges. And they, agree. they take the average of this, right? So that's the coverage issue. So in order to uh, get a sense of whether this accuracy issue is very severe, we can um, go a little deeper in a sense that we compare the following metrics across provider for each exchange and coin pair, meaning um, we just look at um, coin-based Bitcoin and see whether each different providers have the exactly the same sample period, exactly the same metrics. It has to be the same because they anyway download this data from coin, coin base. But there is some suggestion, there is some evidence that it seems like that's not the case. Some providers make some mistake and they didn't do a good job. And for each coin, rather than using market cap, it's probably more precise to use uh, total supp uh, token supply uh, in order to see whether they are uh, more accurate or not. Because to uh, market cap is affected by the price. And uh, total supply, there is a true value. We can easily go to uh, each blockchain and see which is a true value, right? It should be identical across the providers. And this way, we can identify which uh, data providers are relatively less accurate than the others. Regarding coverage, uh, we can check for each coin, identify which exchange is covered. And the provider covering the largest number of exchanges and the most major exchanges like Coinbase, uh, Binance, is likely the best. And I suspect, this is my uh, conjecture, I suspect this too, the coverage is a major driver to explain the uh, discrepancy. However, um, this one as well can be, uh, at, uh, can be important to, to explain this discrepancy. So I think this is the first step to, to learn about how to come up with the, the, the statistical approach to address this uh, discrepancy issue. My next comment is about uh, coverage and, and factor return. As I mentioned, there is substantial uh, variation in coverage across data providers. For example, Kaiko covers only 100 uh, exchanges, whereas CryptoCompare covers about 300 exchanges. That's what they say in their websites. And we see a sizable difference uh, in the factor return. For example, this is um, momentum factor return. And if you take a look at these numbers uh, carefully, this is about 10 and this is about 100, meaning uh, there's 10 times difference uh, in the uh, cumulative factor return. Then the natural follow-up question is, why is the factor return higher or lower in a certain providers? We need to think about this seriously. And maybe one of the explanations is like, attention. Momentum factor can interact with attention, as evidenced, uh, as presented by many other uh, previous paper in equity market. And in general, I would recommend the authors to think about whether some characteristic, exchange characteristic, we can directly observe. This is one one uh, nice thing about the cryptocurrency market. They can check size, location, the level of attention, or certain trading friction. Whether this can be attributed to the dispersed uh, factor returns. And I think understanding the reason for this discrepancy can help us understand, can, can help us reconciling uh, different results observed across different papers. Because I read several papers, uh, and some of the papers say 
uh, momentum effect or size effect is not strong anymore, but some people, some other papers say it's still strong. So there is a lot of like conflicting results across paper, and uh, analyzing the, the reason could be a good way to reconciling all these results. My final comment is about uh, aggregation algorithm. The current statistical approach is based on the assumption that the majority of data providers are accurate. And this is quite reasonable and appealing. Uh, and I think this approach is particularly useful if all providers cover the same exchange. So ideally, if all providers cover the same exchange, one of them is off, and that is mainly driven by the, uh, the poor job of collecting data. However, if they uh, cover very different exchanges, then the, the, taking the median of average price does not have a clear meaning. So I think there is a, a simple way to revise this, this approach. Rather than um, using this algorithm for the average price, maybe we can use this algorithm for the disaggregated data. So let's, for each data provider, let's identify the price in each exchange and use this algorithm to the exchange coin level. Then uh, we can identify uh, the, the outliers and take them out. And then what we can do is we can find the uni of, uni of all exchanges. Some provider has probably 100 exchange, and another provider has 300 exchange. If I take the union, maybe 350 or something, right? We start from that and take out some suspicious exchanges and aggregate those data. Then we can easily uh, address this issue of this median of exchange. Okay, uh, this is a great paper, and I really hope that this will be an excellent guideline for future empirical crypto pricing research. Thank you. Gustavo, for the sake of time, would you rather take some questions from the audience? I think sure. uh, we're, yeah. we're right up against the 10 o'clock, so maybe two or three questions. Sure. Yeah. Take a break. So um, I've got a technical uh -huh. question first, and what another uh, question. So, like, what does closing price mean? Yeah. When you've got these exchanges twenty four yeah. seven. Yeah. That's number one, and hopefully it is exactly the same time across all the exchanges. It's not. Because that could <laughs> introduce dispersion. Yeah. Uh, the second uh, point is that I think that this paper would be. Like more powerful if you provided some sort of rating of the actual data providers. Mm. So I'm a researcher, I see all these data providers, I'm going to pick two. <laughs> Which ones? Is it in CoinMarketCap yeah. and CoinGecko? Something like that. Mm. Um, and you know, some provider that covers 300 exchanges, I don't want that. <laughs> you know, that's not going to be reliable. Yeah. So some sort of rating, yeah. and you know what Bitwise has done in terms of quality of exchanges, mm -hmm. that could be important uh, information yeah. on the characteristics. Yeah. I mean, quick question on closing prices. It's not unique. Different providers do different things. Some do, I mean, most do some sort of volume weighted average of the last closing price, of the last traded prices across exchanges. But even with that, within that, there's different approaches. So every provider has methodological choices too, and they're not transparent about this, so it's very hard to figure out what they're doing. Uh, the rating is a good point, actually. The thing that we notice is that there's not consistently one provider that's always better than every other. One provider is better for Bitcoin, one pro another provider is better for Ethereum, so it kind of depends on the coin, yeah. But yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I will see you. One question is, the aggregation process that you have is uh, at a very low frequency, right? You aggregate prices at low frequency. I'm wondering, like, if uh, you maybe can differentiate how to do it as uh, when you have low frequency versus high frequency, because yeah. I think depending on the type of study you have to do, yeah. you can choose one measure versus the other. That's a good point. Yeah, I definitely well taken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought to rule out. Um, Cost shrinking, adding to the dispersion and reporting volume versus you know, the power law nature. One exercise uh, uh, that, that might be possible is to look at uh, regulated versus unregulated uh, yeah. in this volume. Because regulated ones tend to have less loss trading. And if, yeah. if they, there's still a big dispersion, maybe we can attribute it more to, yeah. uh, to the power law. That's a great point, yeah. Yes. And I think it connects to the comment that Dongwa made. I de didn't think about that, but yeah, definitely we should do this at the exchange level, even reported from the providers. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, 
Has working on this paper caused you to reevaluate anything you found in any empirical crypto papers you worked on? <laughs> I mean, this is not the goal of this paper. We, I mean, I mean it's not yeah. the goal, but like, yeah. you know, does it does it cause you to look at things with fresh eyes? Yes, I mean, so Indicia Labs runs; they do trading based on this, and what. I've seen with them is that depending on how you use the data, you can get vastly different portfolios, perform very differently. So it does have an impact. And yeah, so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I have a couple of points. First, do you see any correlation between how much you need to pay for the data provider and the quality <laughs> of their uh, data? Well, so. Again, this is the point is not to trash any provider. <laughs> there are some providers that are very expensive and very noisy. Uh, so yeah, so we kind of cluster the providers that these are enterprise only providers. They don't have monthly subscriptions. It's like a big annual fee. They try to be like Bloomberg basically. And even those providers have these issues. It's not like there's any provider that has no issue. And, and second, I, you know, take a step back. What's the optimal way? This is a hyper fragmented environment. Yeah. What's the optimal way to aggregate data? If I look at CRISP, right, they don't cover a lot of the MTF. They yeah. don't cover a lot of the smaller exchanges. Just focus on NASDAQ, NYC, yeah. and Amex, and that's it. So maybe we just need Binance and. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to point to, right? We need some guidance. I don't know what the optimal way is. We could probably look at it. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Maybe one more question. Yeah. Take a break. So what are the implications of your findings for automated market makers in DeFi? So we haven't, we didn't look at on-chain data, um, partially because again, the providers that offer on-chain data are different. Uh, we haven't looked at that and we haven't built our own aggregate, like scraping tools. Um, we don't, I, this is not something that I've looked at here, but it's the next step that we want to look into for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you have any other questions for Gustavo, I'm sure it will be available during the break. So I want to thank the audience, thank the presenters and the discussants for a great session.